from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. This is episode 292 of the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. This is the final episode of the year 2020, and this episode is brought to you by Solo Stove. I love my Solo Stoves. It's the hypnotic dancing flames that kiln like warmth, and it's the lack of smoke when burning fuel that gets me excited to start a fire night after night out on the driveway. Whether I'm sitting on that driveway with our quarantine on a cold evening or heating up a meal streamside, and we'll be making lunch along the Potomac tomorrow when we hike one of the fire roads. I always know that my Solo Stove products are solidly built and will last me for years. Good moments, good memories, good products. So you can create a good life. Click the Solo Stove logo on robsnowway.com or the links on my social media link tree as soon as possible. There are still savings. My bonfire right now, you can get $100 off. So please, Every purchase you make helps out my small business. Now on with this episode. Dominic wrote a cheeky letter to his local newspaper. And by local, I mean all of Great Britain. And it was about fly fishing in a scene in a TV show. It went viral. I'm usually hip to things in fly fishing that come across social media, things in pop culture. But this was a surprise to have my dad and my wife send me an article about a fly fishing article written in the UK. The wife and I finally sat down to watch season four, episode one of The Crown, and I was contacting Dominic before the credits rolled. In this episode, I conversed with Dominic about life and fly fishing in England. We'll discuss the scene from The Crown and his thoughts on being an angler and royalist with regards to the program's million dollar budget and acute attention to historical accuracy. I'll have links to Dominic's little article the Queen's episode scene in question, and more information about where they procured the fishing gear for this episode. Have a safe and fun New Year's. I plan to cook something amazing while enjoy a cocktail by the Solo Stove bonfire and retire early for the evening. Let's start first with Dominic reading his letter. Sir, as staunch royalists, my wife and I decided to watch the new series of The Crown, specifically to pick away at the inaccuracies and untruths. However, despite the ample warnings in the press, we were unprepared for the depth of injustice displayed on screen, particularly towards Prince Charles. Most specifically, the show's portrayal of the heir to the throne's fishing technique was utterly unjustifiable, even for sensationalist reasons. To imagine that any self-respecting fisherman would ever allow his line to touch down so catastrophically is bad enough, but to then suggest that such a cast could possibly result in the landing of a fine salmon is tantamount to gross, almost criminal negligence. Never has a TV series clearly lost all credibility with such incompetent aplomb. Yours sincerely, Dominic Witheray. Dominic, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm Dominic Witheray. I live in uh, in Surrey in England, which is near a town called Woking, which is uh, not far from London at all. It's about 20 minutes on the train into into London. I uh, I've lived all over the United Kingdom. I've lived all over Europe as well. And um, I uh, I work for myself. I, I make uh, um, corporate videos and uh, do marketing consultancy. Um, I've done various other things. I uh, have grown up loving fishing. Fantastic. Do you have a celebrity doppelganger that listeners could picture you as while you speak? Possibly Damien Lewis. He's a quite well-known actor. He was in Homeland, Brody in Homeland. Okay. I've been told that there is a similarity between us. All right. Fine. And my wife used to work with his nephew as well, so. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you ever take the train into London to go to Dishoom? Dishoom? What's that? Greatest Indian restaurant in the world. They just opened uh, a couple more. 
Oh my god! No, you see, we we are uh, we we are um, uh, spoiled for Indian restaurants. In fact, in my village where I live, we have two which are absolutely excellent and most villages in england seem to have at least one if not more yes it's a very very popular in fact the most popular takeaway used to be fish and chips but is now a chicken tikka masala so um yeah I, i've not i've not been to dishum but i have been to many 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 indian restaurants i'm so yeah. jealous what about your your local pub how far is that well within sort of three minutes walking distance from me i've got one two three four pubs um the closest is about uh, not quite a hundred yards away um and that's the white heart in chobham directly opposite that is the sun in chobham then up the road we've got the uh the four horseshoes and we've got the red lion as well which is within a couple of minutes walk uh oh and in fact there's a fifth one as well the horse and groom is a, a micro pub which has just opened um in the high street as well so yes that's five pubs within less than a mile of my house that is <laughs> i am so jealous i might have to move to surrey and we're, we're, we're talking open fires, nice snugs, um, proper beer. Yeah, the, the full package. Oh, wow. Yeah, nothing like that here. I can walk in a mile to buy a beer at 7-Eleven. That's the closest I have. <laughs> well, we have, uh, we have, um, we have our, our mini supermarket, the co-op, which is uh, about... 50 yards from the house so uh, you can always stock up from there as well if necessary so yes we we we, we take our we take our drinking seriously <laughs> and how often do you get out to fish um well not that often um i haven't actually fished for a few years now since the advent of my children um who used to uh b before children turned up fishing was a a, a fairly regular activity for me and uh, as with all sorts of other things that uh, one tends to have the liberty for before you get small children but um, I have a rod in the back of my room here waiting for my son but uh, he hasn't uh, hasn't quite taken it up yet but uh, hopefully hopefully in the next well once we're allowed out the house again we'll hopefully uh, maybe in the summer be able to start uh, start some fishing but uh, i used to used to fish all over um and uh, you know all sorts of different types of fishing as well we we, we have very uh, very particular sorts of fishing i mean i'm sure it's the same everywhere in the world but in this country there's there's a definite sort of hierarchy of fishing you have fishing off the side of a boat in the sea which of course is open to absolutely anybody and is is great fun and uh, and uh, catching mackerel on a on a line with sort of 16 hooks on it that sort of thing is uh, is very very popular and then you have the the very esoteric shore fishing seashore fishing which for which um uh, you I have to have very specialized equipment of course to get your your cast out far enough for it to be of of any use at all and that that's quite quite niche not so many people do that and then the most popular um participation sport in the entire country other than um football or soccer for for, for you lot is uh, what we call course fishing which is uh, fishing for a very particular freshwater fish that you then return. You always return coarse fish there. So carp, um, tench, perch. Perch is probably the most uh, most commonly caught. All sorts of uh, pike as well. Uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of fish there. And then you have the game fishing, which is more traditionally with a fly, for trout and salmon primarily. It is. Uh, we're fairly limited as to as to what there is in our waters for, for uh, as far as game is concerned but um trout fishing is is pretty easy to uh, to uh, access over here but um fly uh salmon fishing is can be incredibly difficult to actually um to actually access at all because it's the the stretches of river from which one can fish for salmon are all privately owned 
and incredibly expensive to fish. It can cost between hundreds and thousands of pounds per day to fish for salmon in this country. Um, you know, occasionally there are there are reaches that that aren't so expensive, but of course they'll be well booked up for a long time in advance. And if you're really lucky, you'll know somebody who has a, uh, a stretch of river and will uh, allow you to fish without paying them thousands of pounds for it. But it's um, it, it, so it covers all, all strata of society. While salmon fishing might be quite rare, um, throwing a fly in for, for some trout is, is pretty easy to come by. And there's plenty of, especially lakes, it's very easy to, to fish for trout in, uh, in lakes around here. And there are plenty of them that are specifically stocked as well, you know, managed, uh, managed lakes. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the great vast wildernesses that uh, you're, um, you're uh, so lucky to have over there. And um, so we, we, we can't just rock up somewhere and chuck a line in. It's, uh, it's, uh, you have to be licensed, you have to have the permission of whomever owns the water, and, and it's, uh, it can be a bit of a rigmarole, but um, there is plenty, plenty of availability if you look for it. How far would you have to drive in order to catch a trout or grayling? Oh, not far at all. Um, there are there are multiple reservoirs nearby where, where one can fish. Um, I mean, we're, we're talking... I don't know, uh, fewer than 10 miles, I would think, for the nearest place that's actually viable. And in fact, in the south of England, there are, uh, there are several rivers which are really, really good for fishing and, uh, and also quite expensive. So the Itchen and the Test near the, uh, in Hampshire are particularly, uh, particularly good fishing rivers. There's some very expensive stretches there, but there are lots of, uh, lots of uh, reservoirs and and natural lakes as well where one can fish a lot more easily you know you turn up show them you've got a rod license which you can get from the post office for a, a couple of pounds i think and you can uh, have a day's fishing for not very much at all you just need to make sure that you've got uh, compliant children or whoever it is that you need to get your domestic permission from <laughs> right right and if i'm not mistaken you once caught a cod on the fly I did. I <laughs> and, and what's more, it was it was that very rare um, fishing from the seashore type fishing, but it was on a spinning rod. It was a, a, a kid's spinning rod, a weighted line with a dry fly on the end of it, off a jetty, waiting for a ferry between um, two of the Shetland Islands up in the far, far, far north uh, beyond Scotland. Where the ponies are. And, sorry? The Shetland ponies. Absolutely. Well, yeah, it, where they where they hail from, absolutely. And the Shetlands is a very wild and wonderful place. And Scotland has has slightly more relaxed fishing rules as well. You, so you, you can go to some places in Scotland and and just fish on the um, on the you know you, if you have a landowner's permission. Um, and it's a lot more uh, a, a lot easier to find somewhere. Although the really good places are very expensive. Um, but this uh, was on the jetty. I chucked this uh, waiting board. We had about a two-hour wait for this uh, ferry to turn up. And I put a fly on the end of this rod. It was the only thing I happened to have access to at the time. And I caught a cod on the end of a spinning line, a weighted spinning line with a dry fly. And um, it was about, I suppose it was just over a foot long. I mean, it was it was quite a big fish, especially for that particular setup. It was probably a couple of pounds. Yeah, it was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. In the middle of August in the Shetlands, it was a, a magnificent thing, and it was very delicious as well. <laughs> we didn't throw it back. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, let us get into you know the main reason we have you on today is you wrote a letter to your local newspaper. And it well, was, it was picked up around the world. Yes, it, 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 um, local newspaper isn't quite isn't doesn't quite do it justice. The um, the Daily Telegraph is, I believe, the highest circulating broadsheet in the world. In fact, it's uh, it, it's a, a national paper in this country. We we have local papers, but they are very parochial and uh, and it's usually just adverts for local shops and that sort of thing. We have a, a great tradition of national newspapers 
and the the Telegraph and the Times are the two um, the two uh, biggest national newspapers, uh, are broadsheet newspapers. We have a thing called tabloids as well, which uh, uh, they're physically smaller and full of much more scurrilous stories. But there's a great tradition of writing letters to the, uh, particularly the Daily Telegraph, about all sorts of matters. You write to the editor and, uh, and every day a selection of letters to the editor are published. And it's quite a big deal to have a letter published at all because, of course, they receive thousands and thousands of them every day. And they um, pick and choose a few, you know, uh, uh, 10, 15 letters maybe at most. And so... I, I have had a couple of letters published in the past. Th there is also a tradition that Daily Telegraph is, is seen as a very much conservative newspaper. And our country, uh, a conservative with a small c, it's, it's slightly different to what maybe in the States you might consider conservative. We're probably more, our conservatives are a bit more aligned with um, what your traditional Democrat approach would be, I suppose. And we don't really have anything further right than that. The Telegraph is seen as very traditional and it's uh, very much the paper of the establishment. So um, uh, the lawyers and politicians and, uh, and all those well-to-do people will uh, traditionally read the Telegraph. And it, it has a, a slightly reactionary um, uh, reputation. And it's been very, uh, very vocal in its support of, of policies like Brexit, which uh, I happen to be very against, and all sorts of other sort of right wing, uh, well, to the right of centre, I suppose, um, policies. And, and it has this reputation of being a bit curmudgeonly and a bit old fashioned. And, uh, and if someone's going to be complaining, they're going to be complaining in the Telegraph. And so uh, when there was, uh, there was great interest in the crown, you know, my wife and I had watched it, the previous series, and we'd enjoyed it. And it's it's a great show. You know, it's really well made. And then we were watching the first episode of the new series. And there was this scene with Prince Charles uh, fishing in Iceland. And uh, his casting was so laughably bad. I, it was it was ridiculously bad. And uh, anybody who's seen it who has even sniffed a fishing rod would would see how poorly cast his line was <laughs> it was shocking and i thought uh, i thought oh that's just not on you know they're going on about the inaccuracy of the politics of it and the inaccuracy of the history of it but you know you can't fake a fishing cast it's it's just it is terrible and um and they obviously just didn't care about it they weren't interested so i thought right i'm going to write a joke letter to the Telegraph, which a is going to be taking the Mickey out of the uh, out of the Telegraph itself because it's going to be a ridiculous letter, and b is actually going to make a valid point about the fact that they couldn't care to get this uh, particular facet of their show correct, and it's something that, as I said, you know, fishing is the most popular sport outside of um, outside of, uh, of football in in this country there are millions upon millions of people who will see that and go that's rubbish that's really bad and so it did make a valid point but it was also meant to be very much tongue-in-cheek and mostly making a joke at the expense of the telegraph and then they went and published it and i couldn't quite believe it and i'd even written in the first line of it was my wife and i were watching the crown in order that we could then criticise its inaccuracies. I mean, I was blatantly saying, you know, this is not real. I'm, I'm, I'm clearly taking the mickey here. Anyway, it was published. I hadn't realised it had been published because I don't subscribe to the paper because I don't actually like it. And then um, a friend of mine sent me a, a message, said, oh, you've got a letter in the paper today. And uh, in fact, it was from my son's school and this English teacher had gone into their English class and read them the letter. My son, Arthur, got very embarrassed because his dad had written this, this ridiculous letter to the paper. And then I got all these calls from people saying, oh, yeah, we saw your letter. That's great. But then there's a, a journalist called uh, Jane Garvey, and she, she has 
one of the highest rated radio shows um, in the country called Woman's Hour, which is a daily show specifically marketed at uh, at women. It's on Radio 4, which is you know the original BBC radio station. So it's got a, a, an audience of many million. But, uh, she tweeted a photograph of my letter and said, I've just seen this. Is it real? And of course, she's got multiple millions of people following her on Twitter. And so it got picked up and then it went viral. And I was getting calls from, I got called from uh, uh, India and Nigeria and quite a few from Australia and obviously from the States as well, from all over the place and, and people coming out of the woodwork who I've known. And um, yeah, it just, it went absolutely nuts. My phone, I, I, I barely ever look at Twitter and my phone um, started pinging and, and was almost constantly pinging with all these messages <laughs> and mentions. And I think it was retweeted something like 6,000 times and, and then re-retweeted. And, and it just went absolutely bonkers. And it lasted for a, you know, a good solid week of it. And then um, it was picked up on, on various TV shows as well. And it was in most of the newspapers at least mentioned the daily telegraph themselves are very quiet about it but um but it was uh it was in um in a lot of the other newspapers and newspapers all around the world and um and then it was on um there's a really popular show on friday nights here called have i got news for you which is a it's a, a comedy panel show and it's got well-known comedians and uh, and commentators and they do a quiz show about the week's news and they showed my letter in full on that with my name attached to it and uh, of course that then everybody who hadn't seen it in the paper or on twitter then saw it on the tv and it was mentioned on the main political show on Sunday morning as well, the Andrew Marr show. Um, and um, it was on various radio shows that they were talking about it. And it, yeah, it turned up everywhere. And then uh, there's a, a lovely journalist called um, Heather Schwedel uh, from, um, oh, what's it called? Slate is, I, I think, based in New York. Um, and she interviewed me. And then I was on... Um, on uh, a Canadian radio show as well. <laughs> it was it was quite bonkers, really. It very very different to my normal everyday goings on. <laughs> sort of a highlight to this awful year of yeah. coronavirus <laughs> that you get this little viral bit that goes around towards the end of it, just to brighten things up and keep you entertained. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Most of the comments I had were from people having a laugh. And th that was really what it was about. It was a joke. And, you know, a, a joke that works makes people happy. And uh, it was delightful, actually. Really, really nice to, to see that I'd done something that actually made people laugh. And uh, I had loads of really nice comments from people. There were a few people who, who took it seriously, and I don't think they quite got it. So uh, I would say 99% of, of the response has been that that was funny. And uh, and that was great. It was, it was really very nice. Yeah. That's so funny. My dad told me about it because we really haven't had time to sit down to watch The Crown. I've only seen the no. first episode. So people were telling me, my wife and my dad, they're like, you got to read this article. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, know. it's fun. It, 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 but uh, have you have you had a chance to look at the uh, to look at the episode at all? I did, and I had to analyze it. And the belly of his line hits first. He's using <laughs> about a twelve foot length rod in a stream that's yeah. not that wide, and then he can barely reel the fish in. At one point, he reels backwards, <laughs> and then he takes the preacher and just bashes the life out of this fish against the rock doesn't he just doesn't he just i, I i'm interested there that you call it a preacher because we call it a priest priest that's uh, right there. Uh, yeah priest i tried to use I, your your term i got it wrong well it's um i it was it was horrifying the way he he mangled the fish at the end of it all i you know a salmon is a is a beautiful thing when it's presented on a plate but not if honorable. it's missing half its head <laughs> right yeah that's a dishonorable way to to dispatch um, that fish Absolutely. Absolutely. It was. Uh, but you, you're right. Everything about it was was just off. And, and the poor actor who is brilliant in the show, you know, he he nails Prince Charles and he, he's great. But no one had bothered to show him or, or even all they needed was someone a stand in. 
and to cast and film it from behind. I mean, as, as I, I, I went to film school some years ago, I, I did a second degree, um, a master's degree in filmmaking, and I went to a prestigious film school in London, uh, the London Film School, and uh, learned about the fact that filmmaking is all about trickery. Something as, as straightforward and simple as that uh, is so easy to do. You just put someone else who is competent in his place for that particular shot. And then you can film him as much as you want around about it. It's like um, any other sort of uh, stunt, if you like. You don't get the actual actor to perform the stunt if they're not qualified to do so. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not a difficult thing. But um, I, I think that the, the, the thing that really sort of piqued me was, um, was that it, I, I have... I have a, uh, uh, a bugbear about filmmakers not respecting the audience. And I think that there's a, a lot of filmmaking and television shows that, that clearly the filmmakers think that a particular aspect is unimportant. But in fact, to the audience, it is important. I grew up in a, uh, in a military family and my father every time there was anything remotely military on the film obviously many many films have got people using firearms and uh, and uh, infantry maneuvering and all that sort of thing and uh, every time something came up that was blatantly unrealistic he would make a point of of pointing it out everybody's got their own thing haven't they you know everybody's got their particular area that they know about and when it's wrong in a film or on the telly then they spot it and they go, oh, no, that's, that can't happen. And medical dramas, you, you watch a medical drama with a doctor and, and it's unwatchable because they're always saying, no, you can't do that, you can't do this. And it's exactly the same. And I always feel that there is, there's a responsibility for a filmmaker, especially if they've got a decent budget. There's a responsibility to actually try and get things accurate. When it's a, a right or wrong thing, you know, the history or how people are feeling about things, all of that stuff you have to make up. You're, you're never going to know exactly what's accurate and what isn't. But when there's a, a technical thing and it either works or it doesn't work, it's really easy to get it right. And especially if you've got a budget, a, a movie scale budget for each episode, episode. It's like that. astronomical what they spend on exactly. trying to get everything accurate for that program. Uh, exactly. And they, they, uh, they went and got the particular model of motor car and they, they got the right sort of stitching on a particular uniform, all sorts of stuff. They really, really, really went for to get it right. And then something that is so easy to get right and so absolutely right or wrong. And they just got it catastrophically wrong and you think they do, don't care about this whole swathe of the audience it's totally unimportant and um and so i thought yes it, it probably probably warrants notice but it can be done in a way that hopefully will make people laugh as well so <laughs> hopefully it did i has, think it worked has the crown reached out to you at all no no they haven't and i did to be fair i didn't i didn't expect them to um there's been there's been so much so much about it um and uh you know we've even had government ministers saying that it should have a uh, a, a warning on it to say that it's not historically accurate and there's been political debate about it there have been all sorts of people picking up every possible detail. So, no, I'm, I'm quite happy to stay out of it. I think my, my point has been made. I think they will know my point. They're bound to have heard about it. But, uh, so maybe next time they might, they might uh, if, they, if they venture that way again, they might actually, uh, they might actually get it right. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> they should put a disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> What does a royalist mean? You mentioned that in your article. Yes, again, that's uh, that, that 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 was part of part of the of the joke. As as with any any sort of uh, uh, group of uh, of uh, people, that there are uh, terms and definitions. Now, in this country, generally, we are very much in favour of the royal family. The vast majority of people 
think the royal family give us something special that other countries don't have, whatever that might be, and it's to varying degrees. Um, there are also a significant number of people who really don't like the idea of the royal family and and uh, and want to um, you know want to have a republic and all that sort of thing. They are definitely in a minority, but they're there. Anyway, since the uh, the civil war in the uh, in the 17th century, there's always been a group that's identified as as royalists and people who like the royal family will typically be termed as royalists, but no one really refers to themselves as a royalist unless they're trying to make a particular point. And so a writer, uh, someone writing a letter to the Telegraph in the vein of, I'm absolutely outraged by this, and in a slightly sort of pompous manner, probably would describe themselves as a royalist. Um, and so it, it, it adds emphasis to the fact that we were specifically watching the show so that we could criticise it, which, of course, was the joke in itself. A telegraph, the Telegraph readership is generally royalist. So you can be pretty certain that they're going to be supporting the institution of the royal family almost to a fault. So, um, so uh, that, that's, that's really what it's about. It, it's, it's sort of meaningless because most of us technically, I suppose, are royalists in that most of us like the idea of the royal family. But to, to make a point of saying that you're a royalist, it, it just underlines that you're being a bit pompous, really. Like tongue in cheek. That's too funny. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. All right. Anything else you want to talk about besides the, the episode? And you're caught on a fly on a spin rod. Well, I, 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 I don't know really. I was very interested. Um, I was looking. Uh, I, I had a look at um, at your website and uh, and was looking at some of the some of the more dramatic flies that you have. And um, I remember my brother used to tie flies um, many many years ago, and uh, he he was very very good at it. And they were always very delicate and uh, and mostly dry flies and uh, and you know quite subtle things. And then we went, we went on holiday somewhere, probably in Scotland. We encountered these things called dog nobblers, and they were these bright fluorescent flies, and they were huge, and they were essentially lures, but they, they were technically flies. And they were absolutely magnificent in their efficiency. I mean, we were catching fish all over the place with them. Then in the ensuing years, when I've been to the states um uh and uh the very good friends of our family in um washington state who are um uh, very big uh, very big fishermen and i was looking at some of his flies and it seems as though the flies generally that uh, that he had were very much of the of the dog nobbler type as opposed to what we would more generally expect to see over here which are the more delicate and uh, and um, subtle flies and I, I wondered if if that's uh, if that's something to do with the sort of greater access that we have to fishing on lakes as opposed to rivers and i imagine that you probably have a lot more access to rivers over there and of course in a river where the water's moving fast and uh, and you've got all sorts going on it might be much more beneficial to have something that is a more substantial and robust um uh, bait for the fish I don't know, is that does that ring true at all to you is that yeah we have so access to crazy fly tying material and and the rivers I fish are are usually off color, stained, dark, yeah, maybe muddy. So I'm tying bright things that have a lot of movement that the fish are going to pick up on. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it, it, I, I I it's just something that's it's always I've always thought about, it and I thought because I remember my dad saying it. Oh, it was not it wouldn't be the uh, it wouldn't be the dumb thing to uh, to fish on a uh, on a lake with with something like that even if it's really really good at reeling in the fish because it's it's unsportsmanlike and then when we're in the states it's what everybody uses and it just seemed to make sense and i was thinking it probably is that that difference of what's actually available to us is is what makes the difference because of course the fish are quite happy to go for for anything it's just how you put it in front of them i suppose sometimes yeah. it's fun just to see what they'll eat i've tied flies out of yeah. nerf gun darts <laughs> fish on them 
<laughs> well, you know what? My my uh, my father was uh, he was in the Falklands um, uh, some years ago, and the uh, the the rivers there, of course, are essentially untapped there you know they see about four people a year and you can go to spots where no one has ever fished and uh, there was a particular type of fish i can't remember what it's called it was it's it is nothing that we, we have in the northern hemisphere at all it's this great big game fish right and um he was taken out by a uh, a, a local uh, a, a, well what we would call a gilly i suppose and uh, this guide demonstrated to him that he he had a pre-prepared bunch of keys as a lure and he would throw the keys in and he caught fish on just a bunch of keys that he chucked in this this fast flowing stream in the middle of nowhere <laughs> it's absolutely extraordinary but um but uh, no no such luck with that sort of thing here i fear <laughs> i'm trying to find the name of the fish down there because one of the uh, somebody i interviewed earlier this year had actually been to the falkland islands yeah, and went fishing. Well, they're they're um, amazing. I mean, my dad came back, um, and he mullet. he had a, a freeze. Sorry, what was that? They call it a mullet. Um, it's not a mullet. It was. I think uh, that's the name. I'm trying to look in the article here. No, it's a great big thing. I, I for some reason I have a I have a, a bee in my head. I don't know. I it was uh, it was some years ago. But um, anyway, the, the rivers are absolutely heaving with these things, and, um, and they're very, very good eating as well. He, he flew back with a, a freezer chest full of them that he had caught. I don't think he did much work when he was there, but he did some good fishing. <laughs> While you're in England or here, do you ever drink ice water? As in water with ice in it? Yes, or just beverages with ice cubes. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, you, you, you can't have a coke without ice in it. It's uh, and of course, um, if you want to, uh, if you want to have a decent cocktail, it's almost always got some ice in it. But, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. I even though we don't necessarily have the uh, the, the hottest weather, um, we do generally keep a bag of ice in the fridge or in the freezer rather. Yes, it, uh, we definitely drink that drink was water. First thing and I, I did. The <laughs> first thing I did when I came home was have a huge ice water after I went to Oh, well, have you been served? You've been given drinks without ice, had you? Yeah, I mean, Cokes, it, it just refrigerated, That's... but no fountain That's... drinks. You, you can't get a, a 60 ounce fountain drink with ice in it there like you can here. That's weird. I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. I, you're usually asked if you want ice. And um, and because we we don't have bottomless drinks over here, I know um, we we were on holiday in um, in California last year. The kids were amazed that they could have as much to drink as they wanted, because they just kept on being refilled. Over here, we definitely don't have that culture. So so uh, a lot of people will opt not to have ice so that they can have more of the drink in the first place, because obviously the ice displaces it. So. Um, so a lot of people don't have ice on principle, um, but uh, but it should be available. It should be available. I, I certainly value ice in my drinks, definitely. <laughs> One thing we used to do is we would take flat tonic water and make ice cubes out of that and then put that in our G&Ts so it would not dilute. Oh, very good. Yeah. I would do that with iced tea also. I, would, I, I know you don't probably like iced tea, but <laughs> iced tea, ice cubes in iced tea, fantastic. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I one of the things that um, is I, I uh, in my early years lived on a, a U.S. Air Force base in Germany, and one of the things that uh, that we discovered were uh, what they were called a it was called a brown cow, and I think it's more traditionally called a a, a Coke float, and it's uh, it's basically a Coke with uh, vanilla ice cream in it or root beer. So do that also here. Yeah. Root beer and uh, and that, that is the most amazing, amazing drink. So we've we've uh, as a family very much kept that going, and I think I think it's it's quite a scarcity in this country. We don't uh, we don't often see things like that, but it's uh, it's a wonderful tradition. So they do go both ways. These things. <laughs> I was at a oyster bar in Charleston, South Carolina, that had Guinness or porter. Oh, yeah. With a scoop of homemade vanilla ice cream in it. 
Oh, <laughs> don't tell the Irish that. <laughs> the best Guinness I ever had. It was quite remarkable. Um, in Dublin, there at the the Guinness Brewery, there's a, a museum of Guinness, and you go through this this tour, and it's absolutely fascinating. It really is quite something. Um, and uh, and then at the very end of it, you climb this this staircase up into this amazing bubble that towers over the city of Dublin. And it's, it's the highest point in Dublin. They don't have sky rises there. And then they've got this great tower with this, this bubble. And it's got a bar in the middle of it. And chairs all around the outside looking out of the glass, these great big dome windows. You get to the top and they give you a pint of Guinness. And it's absolutely perfectly served as far as their chemistry is concerned. And it is the most magnificent drink you could ever ever have and it is like nothing else so if you ever get to dublin make sure you go to the guinness tour and have this pint of guinness at the end of it it's it's quite something it's on our list <laughs> and of course in ireland the fishing is incredible my Absolutely. friend has property in galway with salmon so I'm, oh oh well, I'm allowed to go, go fish down there there you go you gotta go that's uh, I, uh between the wilds of Scotland and uh, the wilds of Ireland, there's not much to choose, but the fishing is incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, uh, you're in Washington, aren't you, D.C.? Correct. Yeah, my, my brother actually lives uh, just outside Richmond, and um, he's been, uh, he's been uh, tantalizing me with tales of uh, of fishing that he's been doing he's been traveling off around all over the place and having the most amazing time with all the uh, all the fishing that he's getting there so uh, i can imagine i can imagine what you just have on your doorstep I, i'm very jealous it's it's quite a variety <laughs> yeah. and then when you ever get out here you know give me a ring i will definitely take you out Oh, well, we, we, we will. I mean, hopefully, fingers crossed, hopefully we'll be getting out to stay with my brother in the sometime, maybe even next year. So uh, if we do, we'll look you up, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, that'll be cool. Right. Uh, before you go, can I get you to read your article? And then I'll go put oh. that at the beginning of the, the episode. Yes. Let me let me just try and find it. Um, I've definitely got it here because I, I wrote it. <laughs> and uh, underlined it. In the photograph. Yes, yes. They, they underlined uh, the bit about fishing. Let me, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, this is the benefit of having a podcast producer who can do all this stuff for me. Yes, well, well, I, I, do, um, I do editing. Um, so 80% of my work is, is editing stuff that I've... Uh, that I've filmed and um, and audio editing is an absolute joy because you can get away with cutting wherever you want and as long as as long as you're not overlapping it's wonderful right here we go so this is the uh, I'm reading directly from my original email that I sent to the editor of the Daily Telegraph so uh, sir as staunch royalists, my wife and I decided to watch the new series of The Crown specifically to pick away at the inaccuracies and untruths. However, despite the ample warnings in the press, we were unprepared for the depth of injustice displayed on screen, particularly towards Prince Charles. Most specifically, the show's portrayal of the heir to the throne's fishing technique was utterly unjustifiable, even for sensationalist reasons. To imagine that any self-respecting fisherman would ever allow his line to touch down so catastrophically is bad enough. But to then suggest that such a cast could possibly result in the landing of a fine salmon is tantamount to gross, almost criminal negligence. Never has a TV series clearly lost all credibility with such incompetent aplomb. Yours sincerely, Dominic Witheray. And we get a little siren in the background. Yes, we do. Sorry, that's your uh, your use of words is fantastic. <laughs> well, um, I I, uh, I I spent I spent a little bit of time doing it. I, I did rewrite it. I think probably a couple of times just to make sure I got it right. But um, 
hopefully it it portrays the uh, the, the slightly pompous and ridiculous nature of uh, a Telegraph correspondent. <laughs> so <laughs> it is meant to be a bit. It's meant to be a bit over the top. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, do you have any holiday plans coming up? <laughs> Does anybody? <laughs> um, yes, we we are uh, we're going to go and uh, we're going to go and stay with my mum for a couple of days. She uh, she's uh, on her own at the moment, but, uh, so uh, so we are legally her support bubble, which means we're allowed to go and stay with her. Um, and we're going to go and stay with her over Christmas, and then uh, and then back home, waving at friends from a distance. I suppose is the best we can do. A lot of uh, a lot of Zoom and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, not much else. It's a uh, it's a bit rubbish. Yes, we we we've just been told within the last couple of hours that we're being more restricted than we were before. So all the restaurants and pubs are going to be closed except for takeaways. So we might have quite a lot of takeaways as well. Chicken tikka masala. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Well, Dominic, thank you so much for taking time out of your afternoon. Well, yes, yes, it's the middle of the afternoon now. It's coming up to quarter past two. Yes. All right. I'm going to go clean some ice off of our driveway as we got a storm last night. Ooh. Yeah. Some <laughs> parts chill. of New York State got four to five inches an hour last night of snow. Oh, my word. Oh, my goodness me. Yeah, no, well, we've, we've, had, we've had no, no snow. In fact, it's been quite balmy today. I was out, out first thing this morning in the, uh, on the, the common, which is our sort of local countryside. And there was a little bit of frost, but uh, other than that, no, it's, uh, it's quite sunny here and clear skies and not that cold. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll be in touch when you come to Richmond. Super. Well, right. thanks so much, Rob. It's been a real pleasure. And, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll have tight lines. Yes, that is always the plan. <laughs> All right. Cheers. All right, then. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.